Good evening, Dr. Gates and guests. My name is Pearl Early, and I am pleased to be here with a few of the teachers from Albemarle High School and Louisa County High School. We stand before you with much appreciation of your hard work and commitment to the STEM field at the University of Virginia. The Excellence Through Diversity Distinguished Learning Series has been rewarding and very educational for our students and the community as a whole. The scholar and the activist we are about to hear, Ms. Angela Davis, is just one of many we have, we have experienced over the past five months. Malcolm X once said, education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. Dr. Gates, thank you for the passport to learning and for inspiring our students to greatness. Please come forth and let us honor you. Dr. Gates, on behalf of the Albemarle County's chapter of Nesby Jr., and of the students, the parents, and the teachers, as well as the Community Advisory Committee for that, that program, I am honored to present you this award. Thank you. As well as this copy of a magazine featuring oh. your work with respect to Nesby Jr. Uh, that was presented at the convention last week. Thank you thank so you much so from much. the bottom of our hearts. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much. I got to hug somebody, though. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. That was a surprise. Thank you to Albemarle County uh, Albemarle High School, and to all of you. I've got to collect myself. <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're family now, so we can really say it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Welcome to the Excellence Through Diversity Distinguished Learning Series, an evening with Angela Davis. I hope you're as excited as, as I am. Yeah? Yeah? So as you've heard, I am John Gates, the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in the School of Engineering and Applied Science at UVA. We've been looking forward to this evening for nearly a year. So much has happened in the intervening time that has impacted our consciousness, um, such that this evening seems a most fitting recognition of both our struggle and our continuous quest to live in harmony with ourselves, each other, and humankind. The UVA Excellence Through Diversity Distinguished Learning Series began last year and has included such amazing scholars and artists and activists of contemporary thought as public intellectual Cornell West, political strategist Anna Navarro, NPR host Shanka Vedantam, authors Michelle Alexander, Joy DeGru, Saul Williams, Eduardo Bonilla Silva, and Tim Wise, among others. But it is Angela Davis, Grio, mother of the movement that has become Black Lives Matter, scholar, activist, and chronicler of the black American struggle, who is the reason for our gathering tonight. In a poem she wrote called, Who Am I? And she said, who am I? I don't know. I know what I am, what labels others apply to me. I am human, or so they say. But tell me something. What is so humane about our species? Something found in no others, something humane. I am a lesbian. Yes, a lover of women, but now I choose very selectively. Though weary of trust, I am starved for love. I am a crone, 
old and withered by life, I feel so aged and weary at times, I am sickened by what I see that others do not, even though I seldom see what is right in front of me. I am a child. I look about myself in wonder. Society constantly baffles my mind. I find happiness in the small things of life. I have experienced so little but seen so much. I still believe in love, so naive in matters of the heart. I am an author. I write many stories of loving, living, understanding, though I do not understand these things. I am a poet. At least, that is what they told me. My, my pen touches the paper, and I think of what's important in my heart. My feelings flow freely in verse, and sometimes not. I am a pacifist. I abhor anger and violence. It destroys love, lives, and souls. I think there is always a peaceful solution if one is looking to search their hearts and soul. Though it may be harder, let go of your pride and try. I am a survivor. Many battles I have faced, somehow I always come out of them, but never whole. For it is not that simple. Along the way, I have had to make some sacrifices. But here I stand, in quiet defiance, always will. Though I am tattered, battered, and occasionally shattered, who am I? I think above all, an individual. That is the woman we come to celebrate tonight, Angela Davis. <laughs> Tonight, we will experience the freedom of love and the hope of peace. To bring welcome on behalf of the University of Virginia, I am pleased to present our provost, Dr. Thomas Katsuleas. Tom. Thank you, John, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my great honor to welcome you on behalf of the University of Virginia and to extend a, a welcome to faculty, staff, students, members of the Charlottesville community, uh, visitors from near and far. Welcome to all of you. Um, I'm acutely aware that when you go home this evening, uh, it's unlikely that any, any of you will say, well, that Angela Davis was fine, but I wish that provost had spoken a little bit longer. <laughs> so I will try to keep it short. But I have a few people to acknowledge and a few people to thank. First of all, uh, what an extraordinary series this has been. This is the second season of the Excellence Through Diversity Distinguished Learning Series under the leadership of John Gates and his team. Could you please join me in another round of applause for John for putting this on? What a series. John mentioned some of the speakers who have uh, preceded tonight, including Cornell West, Francis Collins, and Michelle Alexander, among others. We've reached over 10,000 people this year through attendance at events, live streaming, and YouTube videos. The series supports three objectives, to redefine diversity as excellence, expressing itself through the intersection of all people's perspectives and lived experiences, to inspire a sense of belonging at the University of Virginia and beyond, and to construct a new history, the future history of UVA in its third century. And what a job it's doing at all of these things. A little bit about tonight's event. Uh, tickets for this event sold out, guess how fast? <laughs> You've heard, very good. They, <laughs> So, uh, the teacher in me is like, give extra credit to the person in the third row. <laughs> yes, they sold out in two minutes, the most in demand of the whole series. And we have people here from North Carolina, D.C., New York, Pennsylvania, and our speaker herself has come from Dublin to join us here tonight. I, I was going to acknowledge the, the uh, sponsors of the event, and there are many, but I will make a deal with you. 
if you promise to turn over to the back of your program later and read through all of the people who have contributed to this event's success, I will spare you of reading that list. Is that a deal? All right. Let, let's thank them collectively. Thank the sponsors again. And now it's my honor to, do, to introduce two talented performers who will entertain us next. They are Dana Christina Joy Morgan. A, she has a 2005 master's degree in piano performance from Howard University. She's performed across the globe in Japan, Germany, France, and the Interlochen World Arts Center and in the US at the Cleveland Institute. Dana will be accompanied by Josephine Josie Lissette Miller. <laughs> Yay, Josie a fourth year in the Distinguished Major Program in Music. Josie, I understand, had her thesis recital this Saturday, I hope it went well, Josie, and has turned around quickly to prepare for us tonight. Please welcome Dana Christina Joy Morgan and Josie Lissette Miller.
we all know that was for Dr. Davis. So, <laughs> um, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to the performers for that phenomenal um, experience. Um, to Dean Gates, to Thomas Pilnick for allowing me to um, present to you all for this phenomenal privilege, uh, and to all of those who made this event possible. Um, my name is Eric Patton Sharp. I am a second year here at the University of Virginia. I am, I am an African American Studies major and Religious Studies minor, um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight. Um, a prolific author, scholar, and champion for the freedom of all people, oppressed people worldwide. The life of Angela Davis embodies the definition of resilience. Born in Birmingham, Alabama to two educators, Professor Davis was brought up conscious of the importance of community, education, and agitation. By 1969, Professor Davis received both her bachelor's and master's from first Brandeis University and then the University of California, San Diego, respectively. With diligent membership to many groups, the Chayla Mumble Club specifically, she upheld the principles of empowerment for black and brown people here in the United States and abroad. Joined in scholarship with Herbert Marcuse, an influential figure to her during the, her, those formative years, she saw not fit to withhold her fight for social change simply because she was in the classroom. While working for the University of California at Los Angeles in 1970, she was terminated from her position by the, by the California Board of Regents and then at the time Governor Ronald Reagan for, <laughs> uh, for her support and involvement with the Communist Party. Sure. <laughs> Shortly after, she began organizing for the release of the Soledad Brothers, which then the FBI deemed her an affiliate to a courtroom rescue of these political prisoners. Because of her alleged involvement, she became the third woman put on the FBI's most wanted list. Taken from her refuge from the state, she was incarcerated for over a year, but was released on bail on February 23rd, 1972. And I'd like to highlight February 23rd simply because it is an extremely special date to me. In conjunction with to W.E.B. Du Bois' birthday and your release, it was also the day that I declared African American Studies here at the University of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> so synchronicity is also key because we are all relative in a sense. Um, fortunately, she would be later be acquitted of all charges brought against her quite literally does a remarkable story of her life not finished there. In the following years, she has made an even, even greater strides both in academia and the struggle against global capitalism. Having the story of her life being adapted into the 2012 documentary, Free Angela and All Political Prisoners, she is a founding member of Critical Resistance, a national organization devoted to the, to, a national organization devoted to the abolishment of, pris of the prison industrial complex, but also, <laughs> but also internationally, to Sisters Inside, an abolitionist organization based in Queensland, Australia, which works in solidarity with women in prison. Her written work serves as intellectual cornerstones all over. She has authored nine books, notably Women, Race, and Class, and lectured throughout six continents. Throughout her illustrious teaching career, Professor Davis taught, taught at a range of schools, including San Francisco State University, Mills College, UC Berkeley, and Stanford University. Most recently, she spent 15 years at the University of Santa Cruz, where she is now a distinguished professor in Merida of History of Consciousness, consciousness and Interdisciplinary PhD Program and of Feminist Studies. Professor Davis, to me, is so much more than the t-shirts with her mugshots printed on them. She is also a, hope, a symbol of hope, considering the insurmountable challenges she has faced and overcome. A trailblazer, to say the least, as she has devoted her entire life to the cause, always staying true to herself and to those around her. 
throughout this collective journey of liberation. And finally, she serves as a constant reminder to always remain grateful for the work and hardship, those hardships those before me in my time endured because without their efforts, I would not be here today, nor would any of us. To commemorate the very words you said in reference to Herbert Marcuse, you, Professor Davis, taught me and many others, including my peers, that it was possible to be an academic, an activist, a scholar, and a revolutionary. Therefore, on, my, on behalf of my family members and comrades alike, we thank you and are forever indebted, Professor Davis, for all the remarkable work you have done for the improvement of our lives and everyone else. With that being said, to the audience here and online, will you all kindly join me in welcoming our esteemed guest, Dr. Angela Davis. Good evening, everyone. First, uh, let me thank those who have spoken before me, uh, my wonderful introducer, uh, Eric Patton, the provost, the dean, and the performers who gave us such magnificent renditions of Nikoli Sikelele Africa and of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Thank you so much. I'd like to uh, begin my presentations by acknowledging that the land on which we convene is colonized land. And whatever we may be expecting to accomplish with our lives, we cannot forget the foundational violence of this part of the world, violence visited on the native people who were stewards of this land we now occupy. And whether the occupation is intentional or not, if we do not count ourselves among the first peoples of this land, and even if our ancestors' immigration to this country was forced, we remain complicit in one way or another. The damages of the original genocide have not been undone. And the criminalization and general marginalization of First Nations people is a form of violence that reveals deep affinities with the original genocide. And so having said that, let me thank the Office of Diversity and Engagement for inviting me to speak to you this evening. I'm very happy to join those who have participated in um, this series, that, and I, I think I have the title of the series correct, Ex Excellence Through Div Diversity Learning Series. So thank you for the invitation. This is the first time I've been on this campus uh, for uh, since, um, Eight years ago, I was then invite, invited by Professor Deborah McDowell <laughs> and have wonderful memories of the more extended period I spent uh, on this campus. Uh, but I, 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 I should tell you that um, it was mentioned that I came directly here from uh, Dublin, Ireland. And when I was asked in Dublin uh, where I was headed, and I said Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, uh, people expressed uh, deep concern for my safety. Uh, uh, 
And I think it's important that you, you know, recognize the reputation uh, 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 that has circulated around the world, which, is, which means that, that you are, you, you really must commit yourself to social transformation, to eradicating racism. And because this is the first time I have visited Charlottesville since the tragic events last summer, during which Heather Heyer was killed by white nationalists, I want to honor her for her commitment and for her courageous action. And I would also like to pay tribute to her mother, Susan Bro, uh, because they both, they both make us feel extremely proud to be a part of the anti-racist continuum of the history of the United States of America. towards the end of Women's History Month, uh, during which we reflect intensely on the centrality of women's rights and women's contributions to struggles for social justice, gender justice, racial justice, sexual justice, environmental justice, economic justice. Uh, and of course, um, of course, women were the first factory workers, uh, the first proletarians. Uh, the creation of the factory was based on bringing women's work, which was spinning and weaving and making garments, under one roof. Uh, uh, some of you who are familiar with uh, women's labor history may be familiar with the disastrous fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in 1911 uh, because the workers were locked in. Um, scores of them uh, died. Uh, the, the labor organizer, Rose Schneiderman, coined the, Fred, coined the phrase, rather, bread and roses in 1912. Uh, while organizing against the sweatshops in the wake of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. What the woman who labors wants, she said, is the right to live, not simply exist. The right to life and the sun and music and art. The worker must have bread, but she must have roses, too. And I begin with, uh, uh, with this quote, because I think it's important to acknowledge that women have always been the backbone, the backbone of the labor movement, even when they were excluded from paid labor. In fact, women have been the backbone of all movements. The Civil Rights Movement, the Black Liberation Movement, uh, the, um, the movements in, in, in Latinx communities. Uh, and, and let me say that because we are witnessing during this period a resurgence of movements for social justice, uh, um, we can say that as distressing as it has been to try to come to grips with the fact that, that um, Donald Trump was actually elected to the presidency of the US, <coughs> it has been heartening to see that so many people are refusing to allow the clock to be turned back on our past victories.
And of course, um, uh, in, in the wake of the women's marches um, January a year ago and this January, we were able to witness the amazing mobilization in Washington last Saturday. Um, the activism of high school students. Uh, and what adults have been unable to do for decades and decades, that is to say, to stand up to the NRA. <laughs> Children, young people are now doing this. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this uh, before I uh, conclude. Uh, but I think it's important to point out that we are that what we are witnessing is the result of many decades of struggle against racism within the labor movement, against misogyny, for LBGTQ rights, for environmental justice, for the rights of disabled people, against imperialism and solidarity with many struggles around the world, South Africa, Palestine. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the um, social and economic conditions that uh, uh, produced the current situation. Um, many of you now are aware of the, the campaign to not to reform prisons, but to abolish the use of imprisonment as the major mode of punishment. Um, but in, in order to understand what led us uh, uh, to this um, um, horrendous situation where, and I'll, I'll, since this is Women's History Month, I'll use the example of women, where one third of all imprisoned women on the entire planet are imprisoned in jails and prisons in the United States of America. Uh, where um, the numbers of incarcerated women increased between the years 1980, um, 1980 and 2014 by more than 700 percent. Uh, when I first became involved in, in this movement, there were approximately, or approximately 20,000 women in prison in the U.S. And now there are over 200,000. Um, um, so I want to talk about the fact that the 1980s actually marks the emergence of what we now uh, know as the, the most recent stage, the most recent instantiation of capitalism. Um, and you know, particularly given our current political situation, I think that we have to engage in more public conversations about capitalism. Uh, you know, particularly since many of our struggles for social justice uh, are at bottom, even if we don't say it, uh, struggles challenging the way in which capitalism has used and manipulated racism and misogyny and homophobia and transphobia and so forth. And so, the, the period during which capitalism um, came to uh, be globalized, uh, uh, and I, I shouldn't say that the 1980s is precisely that period, because capital has always had global aspirations, uh, but uh, the mode of manufacturing changed. Uh, uh, it begins to take place across national borders. Uh, and incidentally, what is interesting is that this stage of capitalism has begun to reveal the obsolescence of the nation state 
as the most appropriate form of human community. Yeah. After all, capital, information, commodities, knowledge, all of these things flow very easily across national borders now. But what happens when people join that flow? They are referred to as illegal. Corporations can emigrate, but people can't. Uh, And I mention this because I think it is so important to make connections between what is often referred to as uh, uh, the immigration crisis, uh, uh, the, the, the migrant crisis, not only in the U.S., but, uh, in, but all over the world, uh, actually, in, in Europe, in Africa, in Australia, uh, uh, that, uh, that we, we recognize that there is a connection between um, that crisis and the crisis of imprisonment, uh, uh, the rise in the numbers of people uh, who are held behind bars. Uh, because all of this began to take place in the 1980s at a time when the welfare state was under assault. Um, uh, and dangerous shifts began to occur away from investment and processes that reflected people's needs and toward profitable sectors of the economy. Uh, look at the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, you know, look at, 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 at uh, the degree to which um, medication that could, 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 could save people's lives is inaccessible to so many and I'm thinking about I'm thinking about uh, the the drugs for hep C uh, the if one looks at the situation behind bars um, huge numbers of prisoners have hepatitis C but they are, are unable to take advantage uh, of the the new medication because it it costs um, um, $90,000 for a series of, uh, what, uh, 10 or 11 pills. Uh, countries in the global south during the 1980s were also affected uh, um, by this uh, because it, it meant that global finances began to require that and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the, the huge institutions like the World Bank and the IMF began to require countries as a condition of receiving loan to move their capital away from sectors of the economy that benefited people and towards profitable sectors. Uh, and so what happens? Uh, the, the welfare state uh, deteriorates, uh, uh, people in the U.S., uh, um, many people no longer have jobs because the corporations have migrated across, across national borders seeking cheaper labor. Um, education becomes inaccessible. Health care becomes privatized. And th th these are the conditions that led to what is often referred to as mass incarceration. The surplus populations were produced who not only could not find jobs, but lost all of what used to, to be called the, the safety nets, right? The welfare system. Uh, and at the same time, these conditions were responsible for forcing people to um, join uh, those who were moving to other countries to seek better lives. Uh, and if we ask why uh, uh, immigration from Mexico and Central America began to occur when it did, um, look at, at the, the, the U.S. corporations that moved into Mexico. Uh, and made life unlivable. Uh, when, 
when we began many years ago to organize against the prison industrial complex, we did not know that our analysis would become even more important during the second decade of the 21st century with the election of a billionaire capitalist to office uh, uh, who presumes who presumes to want to reverse the very processes that allowed him to make his billions. I mean, this is, this is the irony. And, and in a sense, um, those of us who consider ourselves um, organizers have to assume responsibility a measure of responsibility for failing to make these connections, for failing to provide an analysis that would allow those white working class people whom Trump was able to seduce with his um, promises of, of, of more jobs and reversing the, the, the processes that happened during uh, the rise of global capitalism. Uh, uh, it, we have a measure of responsibility for failing to point out that they suffered from the very processes that created um, poverty and that, that led to the criminalization of vast numbers of black and brown people. Um, and that should be an indication of the work should, we should be doing now. Um, let me say that. And as we engage in this organizing, feminist approaches are very important. Uh, when, when I um, suggested that perhaps we failed to make the connections that we should have, I'm, um, I'm, I'm referring to a feminist methodology of um, trying to you know, understand um, um, intersections, uh, intersectionalities and relationalities and connections. Uh, um, and of course, some people thought that as, as, as figures like Gloria Steinem grew older, that feminism would also become obsolete. Uh, but they didn't recognize that new waves of feminism had emerged and that the most vibrant forms of feminism today are not what we used to call mainstream white bourgeois feminism, so, uh, but rather it is anti-racist feminism. <laughs> not, not carceral feminism that has learned how to rely on the police and prisons to solve the problems of women, that is to say the, pro the problems of, 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 of sexual violence and gender violence more broadly, but, but rather what we might now call abolition feminism. So what, what, is, um, what is different today uh, when we look at um, social justice movements is the, the influence, the impact of feminist approaches. Uh, uh, Anti-racist, anti-capitalist, international feminism that allows us to apprehend the interrelationality of all of our contemporary struggles for social justice. Uh, and of course we see this in movements like um, Black Lives Matter. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy uh, that uh, mobilizations are occurring daily. And I'm thinking about, I'm from California, I'm thinking about uh, the horrendous uh, police murder um, of Stefan Clark. Uh, not long ago, and it's uh, so ironic that uh, Alton um, uh, Sterling's um, killers were uh, 
basically um, told that um, um, they did the right thing, that actually black life does not matter. And, and so, as I was saying earlier, historically, women have done, have done the work, but haven't received the credit. Um, and now we're seeing the, the recognition, finally, after decades and centuries of women's leadership of black women's leadership, of queer black women's leadership. And this is, this is not a mere substitution of women for men retaining the same paradigms of leadership, but rather a transformation of the very notion of leadership. And let, let me say that um, um, many of our slogans um, have seduced us uh, in ways that have um, in, 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 in encouraged us to assent to assimilation as the primary strategy of, of righting wrongs, the primary strategy of achieving social justice. Uh, and you know, what about, we think, I'm, I'm gonna use the term diversity because diversity has circulated uh, uh, everywhere, especially in academic, uh, communities, but also in the corporate world. Uh, uh, the assumption is that all we need is more diversity. And I'm not suggesting that diversity cannot do good work, but it has to com be combined with justice. It has to be combined with engagement. Um, Diversity without changing the structure, without, without calling for structural transformation, simply brings those who were previously excluded into a process that continues to be as racist, as misogynist as it was before. And so this is why it is so important to, to embrace analyses that uh, um, recognize connections and, and, and intersections. Since the period of the late 60s and early 70s, we've developed new approaches, more elucidating vocabularies, more revealing analyses, and thanks to feminist scholars and Organizers, we've begun to understand connections and relationalities and intersectionalities. If we, if we fail to perceive these relations, these crossings, these junctures, these coincidences, these overlapping and cross-hatching phenomena, we will be forever imprisoned in a world that appears to be white, male, heterosexual, cisgender, capitalist, US, and Eurocentric. We have learned from feminist studies that the world is not homogeneous, that all of the women are not white, that all of the blacks are not men, that we cannot simply call for gender justice if we do not also include racial justice, economic justice. So, so this means that we have to develop 
habits of perception, habits of analysis that acknowledge the inadequacies of the conceptual tools on which we are compelled to rely. Not long ago, I, I asked an audience, uh, um, so when did women get the vote in, in the US? Um, and so what do, you, what do you think most people said? 1920, yeah. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> uh, I mean, of course, 1920 is an important historical date, but if you take into consideration the fact that the majority of black women did not get the vote until 1965, how can you continue to insist that women got the vote in 1920? One woman cannot stand in for all women, especially if that woman is white and affluent. Racial and economic hierarchies often prevent us from understanding how we can most effectively unite and move forward. The question to ask is, if, if this woman moves forward, if this woman who continually strives to break through the glass ceiling moves forward but leaves everyone else behind, is this really a blow for women's equality? Now this is why I think the Black Women's Club movement developed as their, as their slogan, lifting as we climb. <clears throat> now, I want to talk a little bit about some connections that uh, we perhaps uh, have not uh, made in, in um, the ways we should have. Um, we've been focusing a great deal um, on gun violence during this last period. And we have witnessed these um, brave and eloquent uh, young people from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida speak out against guns. And as they stand up to elected officials, as I said before, they are showing us that the NRA can be challenged. And we see many young women in uh, their ranks and among the spokespersons. But I think it's important to note that they are following in the footsteps of another group of young people, the Dream Defenders, who responded in the state of Florida, who responded similarly to the killing of Trayvon Martin and to the failure to hold George Zimmerman accountable for Trayvon's death. Uh, uh, the, the young people from um, the um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School engaged in some of the same forms of activism uh, because they learn from the dream defenders. Uh, uh, and I think that as we identify uh, with their grief and applaud their activism, at the same time, we have to remark that young black activists have not been similarly greeted. Uh, <laughs> The students from Parkland, Florida are not letting us forget that gun control should have been enacted decades ago uh, before the gun industry profited on the millions of, goals, of guns that they have sold, more than 300 million guns. I mean, can you imagine there are more guns in this country than there are people? Uh, yes. 
<laughs> and we're not, I don't think we're even counting the official guns, the guns of the military and the guns of the police. And, you know, um, my feeling is that um, we should always ask for what we want, right? Uh, uh, we shouldn't hold back. Uh, and in, in this context, we have to also begin to talk about disarming the police. Yes. Let's get rid of all of the guns. And let us also remember that they're following in the footsteps of, of the Ferguson protesters in, 19, in 2014, who, when Mike Brown was killed, they refused to go home. They kept coming back every single day. Uh, and I think these connections allow us to understand the threads that bind us together and allow us to recognize how critical we should be when news anchors refer to the Parkland students as very telegenic. Uh, uh, that they seem more representative. Uh, there are not as many black students. Uh, uh, and, and if we compare that to the, the, the fact that while the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for black lives have, has, has been embraced by some, others have recoiled in fear because black evokes fear. But I want to talk about another important connection. The link between the rising of women against sexual assault and sexual harassment. Uh, and you may have heard um, that um, um, the doctor at Michigan State who engaged in sexual molestation uh, of, uh, of hundreds of young girls, uh, over 150 have come forward. This is not even counting those who, who did not uh, come forward. Uh, uh, but we're now recognizing that that was, um, that there was a great deal of complicity. Uh, uh, and sexual violence also has its institutional framework. Uh, and it's so often Treat it as if it is simply a problem of the individual. If, if we were historical minded and considered the long history of black women contesting the deep links between sexual assault and racist institutions, we might learn something about sexual violence. Rape was an integral element of slavery. Racial dominance, sexual dominance mutually reinforced each other. The slave master was the sexual master as well. Today we tend to see sexual assault and harassment as flowing from defective individuals. So just get rid of the men who are perpetrating gender violence. Just fire them from their jobs and send them to prison. Uh, I think Larry Nassar got 175 years. But forget about the institutional context, the structural character of this violence, which means that as the perpetrators go to prison, the gender violence is reproduced over and over again. This, I think, is a very powerful argument for prison abolition. Um, because uh, uh, if we did not have this institution, which not only devours human beings, 
but it devours um, our ability to understand the problems behind the reasons that people end up going to prison. Put them in prison and don't, you know, and forget about it. Uh, uh, and in the meantime, um, sexual violence, child molestation, you know, all of these uh, horrendous uh, uh, acts of harm continue to be reproduced. Um, but I also have another question to ask you. Why do we treat gun violence as separate from sexual violence? I mean, what greater example of toxic masculinity do we have than male figures with guns. And we've seen these images, the images of pushing, the images of the, 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 the um, cops in, in, in Ferguson clothed in their military garb with their tanks and with their big guns uh, pushing back uh, uh, the Ferguson protesters. What, better symbol of the nox noxious masculinity that needs to express itself by harassing or attacking women. Uh, I mean, why is it that we can't make those connections? Why do we see them as entirely separate problems? Feminist approaches call for thinking things together that have been ideologically separate, separated. How is it that we could have ever thought that it might be possible to achieve women's liberation while leaving behind indigenous women, Latina women, Muslim women, Asian American women, black women, trans women, Why is it so difficult to recognize trans women as women? Even though, even though we know that gender, especially the binary structure of gender, is totally constructed. Historically, historically black women were not recognized as real women because they were too outspoken, too angry, not submissive enough. Thus the whole 19th century cult of true womanhood, true womanhood was white, true womanhood was middle class, et cetera, et cetera. Why, why can't we not recognize this? Not acknowledging the heterogeneity of gender, cisgender, transgender, gender fluid, gender nonconforming, et cetera, not acknowledging this disarms us. It prevents us from contesting violences that ultimately affect all of us. And I'm thinking about the letter that was, the open letter that was written to me when I was um, in jail uh, by James Baldwin, who wrote, uh, if they come for you in the morning, if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us at night. Black trans women are the most consistent targets of violence, of individual violence, stranger violence, intimate violence, partner violence, but also institutional violence, state violence, police violence, prison violence. Radical feminist approaches allow us to understand that issues that might appear to be minor and marginal often have major and central, thus vast, implications. Speaking about minor struggles with, with vast implications, um, let us remember that that it was Palestinian activists who initiated the global response to Ferguson in 2014. And the 
that we have, uh, uh, we have to uh, em embrace a, a kind of mutuality in which we recognize our responsibilities to take up uh, the struggle against the occupation of Palestine. <laughs> And I was talking about, um, I mean, there was an anti-assimilationist theme in my remarks uh, 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 that, uh, that we're not trying to um, simply bring those who have been previously excluded into a framework that remains exactly the same as it was when they were excluded. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing the extent to which uh, we uh, have been compelled or seduced into uh, believing that it's only a question of, of being let in. You know, and we forget about transformation. Uh, uh, and I was referring to leadership that, um, I was referring to black women's, women's leadership, queer women's leadership, the leadership of women of color. This is, I mean, what's really exciting about this period is that we're witnessing the rise of women. Yes, we are. And everybody should be happy about that. Men especially should be overjoyed that they no longer have to stand up to these, um, to, to the, to, to, to these measures of noxious masculinity. That they can, that, that men can take feminist positions as well. So, so we have to think about breaking rules. Um, breaking rules, developing practices of subversion, envisioning new frameworks, uh, envisioning revolutionary frameworks. Because so many of our problems have to do with assenting to these processes of assimilation. How can we believe that it is possible to simply be included without transforming the terms of inclusion? Uh, you know, the terms of inclusion wherever, uh, in, 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 in the academy, uh, um, in the job, uh, in the movement, uh, um, in, in art and music. Um, who needs to be included according to terms that will require us to replicate the, res the structures responsible for exclusion? And I think this is one of the reasons why it has taken us so long to um, develop radical strategies to end racism. Because in a sense, what we're having to do in the second decade of the 21st century is what should have been done in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. So what is the point of endorsing race and gender diversity within a framework that remains racist and heteropatriarchal to its core? Assimilation may appear to be our friend. It may be the easiest way, but it is really our arch enemies, seducing us to participate in apparatuses that more effectively carry out the business of suppressing change. 
So this means that we need to practice the process of straddling contradictions, of dwelling within them, even learning how, in the spirit of Audre Lorde, to identify the spark of creativity that can potentially emanate from these contradictions. Uh, I'm, I constantly remind myself, as Patricia Hill Collins said long ago, that, that we can choose both rather than either or. Uh, um, it's a very nice feminist dialectic. And I think the consciousness among young activists that women have the right to lead, that young black women have the capacity to give leadership, that queer young black women, including trans women, are reconceptualizing leadership and can help illuminate the path toward freedom. That leadership is not, that leadership is not intrinsically male. Thank you. That it is not intrinsically based on the charismatic, individualistic, masculinist model, but rather can be collective and feminist. <laughs> and as I um, conclude, I wanted to uh, add a few remarks about um, art. Um, because um, during periods when we are not certain uh, where we are going, when we may know what we are opposed to, but we may not have a clear sense of where we want to go, only that we want something better. We want to go someplace better. Uh, art has the, uh, the capacity to offer us experiences uh, that, that can illuminate that future. Art can illuminate our past, our present, our future, and at the same time, we can experience happiness. You know, music can lift us up and to an aesthetic realm where we are not only aware of our own individual happiness, but we are conscious that this is collective knowledge and a collective experience of happiness. Uh, I think we need to pay more attention to the knowledge uh, that we can acquire through the experience of art, uh, whether we're talking about music or film or literature or painting, uh, murals, street art. Uh, you know, why all of this is so special? Because it's, it's, it's often bathed in a sense of exhilaration that allows us to incorporate that knowledge into our own experiences in a way that that may not necessarily happen when we confine ourselves to purely conceptual forms of knowledge. This is a very exciting um, moment in history. And um, I'm very happy that, uh, that I'm able to witness uh, this period. And, 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 and I um, also see myself as standing as a witness uh, for those who did not uh, uh, make it this far. Increasing numbers of people all over the world are recognized that things have got to change. Uh, um, and we, we see um, um, movements uh, that are led by immigrants, uh, by native people. Let us not forget the, 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 the courageous stance at Standing Rock. Uh, And the knowledge that was imparted to us that if, if we do not engage in active support of struggles for environmental justice, it makes no sense to continue to do the other work that we are doing. Because if our planet disappears, 
And I think we owe a great deal to people in uh, the uh, movement uh, for transgender rights. Because, because challenging the gender binary challenges that which is, you might say, most normal in our lives. And so frequently, the, the crux of our struggle uh, can be discovered precisely in those things that we tend to take most for granted. Uh, uh, and, and so the, that, that, that ability to recognize the ideological um, uh, basis of the binary gender structure puts us in a position where we can begin to challenge other uh, um, expressions of uh, the normative uh, race, gender, etc. And I haven't um, had the opportunity to talk, to talk about um, the struggles of disabled people. That's another, you know, major. And so those struggles help us not only to um, guarantee that the rights of disabled people are respected, but they tell us something about the way in which we have been made into these people who do the work of the state without even recognizing it. And so these are just, you know, some of the struggles. I could have referred to the food justice movement, uh, which is, you know, also important, um, but um, but I I'm compelled to end now uh, <laughs> because my time is uh, I'm ten minutes over time, uh, and I'll I'll simply say uh, with um, Ella Baker, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you very much. Question and answer period, right? Okay. So, we'll have you go to the middle of the stage. Now, I know you have questions, but I must say that there are lots of us and time is short, right? So, please, questions and not dissertations, right? Um, since I have the mic, I will very politely um, end your conversation. <laughs> there should be mics in the center aisles, or will be very, very shortly. And I see that Wes Bellamy is going to begin us. Of course. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis, I would be remiss if we didn't say thank you for coming. Um, absolutely amazing. I'm a city councilman here but I think you remind me so much of two people. One, Miss Pearl Early. Well, you two even look alike. I call affectionately my mom. And my sister, Nakaya Walker, our mayor, the first female African-American mayor. You two are aligned. I had a chance to um, go to Oakland a couple weeks ago, and I went to the headquarters of the Panthers. And one of the questions I have to ask of you is, what do you think that uh, Huey Newton would think of the movement today, or Mr. Seal, or Eldridge Cleaver, 
And do you think that if the Black Panthers were as powerful today as they were back then, do you think that they would still receive the same amount of support? Or would there be backlash like we oftentimes see with movements for black lives? Well, thank you for your question. Um, and it's a question that's very difficult to answer uh, because we're talking about um, a movement that emerged uh, at a particular moment in the history of this country uh, um, when we did not know nearly as much about what we need to be struggling for as we know now. And of course, the Black Panther Party was an amazing, um, an amazing phenomenon. Uh, uh, you know, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale uh, uh, have to be continually congratulated for their imagination uh, and for the way in which, which um, they captured the imagination of the world because not only did Black Panther parties um, or Black Panther Party chapters uh, emerge all over the U.S., but all over the world. Uh, you know, there was a Black Panther Party in New Zealand, there was a Black Panther Party in Israel, there was a Black Panther Party in Brazil, and I could go on and on and on. Um, but... Um, We can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe somebody will ask a question about that. But you know, let me just say that at that time, um, most of us assumed that leadership had to be um, um, well. There were women who assumed that, it, that leadership could be uh, uh, exercised by women as well. But during that period, did you, did you know that the majority of the members of the Black Panther Party were women? Did you know that? Did, did, did people know that? Yeah, but what, but, but what figures do you associate with the Black Panther Party? So. Who was doing the work that allowed that organization to emerge? And, and so I'll, say, I'll say one thing, because people have often asked me uh, uh, to compare the Black Panther Party and uh, Black Lives Matter. And, and what I often say is that um, it, was, it was really remarkable when Huey and Bobby had the idea of patrolling the police are patrolling the community, um, uh, and they each had a gun and a law book. Guns were legal then, so that's another question. See, that has completely changed now when we look at the particular um, uh, contemporary situation. Um, but, but that approach was about policing the police, using the same um, strategies that the police use, even if only symbolically. And I think now we've come to recognize that we can't, there's no way we can stand up to the police using the same uh, methods and weapons that the police use. So what we, what we now ask for, and this is the diff one of the major differences between Black Lives Matter and the Black Panther Party, is, is transformation of the very structure of security, so abolish the police. You know, get rid of their guns. But it, it makes no sense to engage in the kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, comparisons because it's history that intervenes. Uh, and and, and we, we would not be here today as we are were it not for the contributions of the Black Panther Party. Uh, um, uh. But at the same time, we can never import or export uh, 
uh, organizations and movements and ideas. The ideas have to emerge within the context of the current moment. And this is why it is so important for young people to be in the leadership. Uh, because older people tend to replicate what we have always known. And that, that is, yeah. Thank you. Next question is here. Hi, Professor Davis. Uh, my name is Robin Berube. It's a really, uh, it's an honor to come see you. I drove down from Brooklyn to hear you talk. Um, from where? Brooklyn? Brooklyn, yeah. Uh, this is actually my second time in Charlottesville. First time was for Michelle Alexander over here. Um, and uh, the question uh, I wanted to ask was uh, in regards to education not only as an activist, but as an educator yourself. Um, as m most of us probably know in this room, the history that we're taught, especially as children, you know, that fundamental education, especially in history classes, is not American history, but white history. And, and uh, one thing that I really want to focus on in my own work is, you know, going to, um, you know, how they formulate the different curriculums for history classes, because even when the teachers might not want to specifically teach that part of history, you know, the school board education, the whole educational system tells them what it is mandatory to teach kids growing up. And that skews their whole view, and that's really where, you know, the beginning of seeing equality instead of equity and not seeing the racism and the and thinking that it all ended during civil rights and you know when all that that fake education you know how is it that we can go forward and really change the way that education is being taught at the lowest levels in our grade schools and our high schools so that we no longer have the problems we're having with adults that's it right there stop <laughs> okay okay well <laughs> You know, I think that uh, uh, contained within your question is uh, the seed of an answer, uh, that something has to change. And change only happens when we engage in the kind of activism uh, at multiple levels. Uh, so, um, yeah, teachers uh, um, and students uh, are very important uh, in that transformational process. I think, you know, I think it's becoming clear that we really need a revolution in this country because everything is interconnected. Uh, you know, we can't change the prisons and leave the schools intact. Uh, uh, you know, we can't deal with the police and leave the universities uh, functioning in the way that they are. So, yeah. Thank you. Next question. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Shubhala Lakhere, and my question, I'm a law student at the University of Virginia School of Law, and my colleagues and I are all here, and we'd like to thank you. Um, my question is um, twofold, concerning the next generation of law schools and our unique experience. Um, I was hoping you could speak to that um, experience, as well as um, the divide that I see, because I am Nigerian, and so, the divide I see between black Americans and African Americans, or blacks in the diaspora. I was hoping you could speak to ways that maybe, maybe you speak to that experience as well, please. Law schools in? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Well, I'm, I'm trying to see, uh, to, you know, to answer succinctly because I see there are two long lines. Uh, um, yeah. Um, Lawyers are really important um, in the sense that they um, not only have to know the law, but they also have to develop critiques of the law. And they, they uh, you know, one of the major um, issues in that problem of assimilation that I was talking about is the centrality of the uh, of legal discourse and defining what we mean by equality and defining what we mean by by justice. Uh, so um, um, people like um, you know Kimberly Crenshaw, Cheryl Harris, and others uh, who 
uh, develop uh, critical race theory, I think have uh, showed us uh, how we can um, uh, learn the rules in order to break the rules. I think that's the job that progressive law students should be doing. And then the other question, yeah, that's a really important issue. And, um, uh, you know, why do we call ourselves African American? I, I, I don't know why. Uh, and why did that stick? You know, there, there's this long history of figuring out how we would refer to ourselves uh, that uh, begins, of course, with the contestation of Negro, uh, well, and black for a while, colored, all of that, yeah. Um, but why do we get so stuck on this, this term that reeks of nationalism? Because, I mean, I could understand if we were, if we, if African American, people who uh, inhabit the Americas and identify with the African diaspora, then African Americans would be all over the hemisphere in Brazil, all over South America, in the Caribbean, in Canada. But it becomes a term that plays a, a role that is hierarchical. Uh, and, and I actually, I prefer black. I, I, you know, because black gives, black is, 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 a, is, a, is a political um, identity. It's about identifying with the struggles of black people all over the world. And those are the, the struggles that have been, been most consistent, most persistent uh, with respect to the desire for freedom. It's black people who incorporate that desire. And so black history belongs to everyone who believes in freedom. So yeah, that's the beginning of an answer. You see, I'm pretty passionate about this, but thank you. <laughs> Professor Davis, my name is Rauda. I'm a junior at the University of Virginia. Um, seeing you speak up there with the University of Virginia, you know, little thing behind you, kind of put me at a crossroads. Um, I think a lot of my friends are also at a crossroads right now. How do we deal with the fact that an institution this university that has incredible people like Dean Gates, for example, and brings incredible pro icons of resistance like yourself, is also the same institution that shuts us down when we try to implement the exact same strategies. Recently, recently, uh, student protests against um, Israeli apartheid was shut down and student, students were arrested and charged. Um, meanwhile, they, did, they safely and kindly escorted the Nazis who marched on the same grounds out on August 11th. Um, uh, Again, same institution doesn't pay a living wage, actively dis dismantles African American communities. <laughs> um, and yet, they bring incredible, iconic people like yourself who teach us the strategies to fight them, then shut us down when we try to use what we learned as students. How do you, what advice do you have for those of us who are trying <laughs> to work with that. <laughs> I should ask you, what advice do you have? <laughs> because you said so succinctly and so powerfully the point that I was trying to make about the, these um, efforts to um, 
assimilate uh, not only people but but struggles. Uh, this this university, like every university, um, participates in all of these processes of oppression. I mean, and just because just because I get hired to teach at this university, or just because I get accepted to study at this university, doesn't say anything about the, 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 the university itself. And certainly not that the university has transformed as a result of those acts. Uh, so that means that it's up to those of you who inhabit this space now uh, to do the work, to begin to do the work of transformation. And it means that, I mean, you know, students generally don't have a problem. Uh, they, they don't feel identified uh, with the university. Uh, but, f but people who get paid by the university, faculty and administrators, somehow uh, feel obliged to um, s support the institution, even when the institution is engaging in the most horrendous uh, forms of, 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 of subjugation. Um, so yeah. You know, uh, and you know what can I say? Um, um, I, I mentioned Audre Lorde and the importance of embracing contribution, con um, contradictions, uh, and contributing um, to um, the understanding that that we don't have to choose one or the other. We don't have to say. I am not going to this university, or will not teach at this university because of the, uh, you know, because of the terrible racist legacy and because of the current practices. We can, we can, both be critical of and inhabit the space. I mean, I've had to. I've been in universities for the vast majority of my life. Uh, so I've had to figure out you know, how to do that and, and how to create the kind of community that will remind people why they're here and remind, and remind people that it has, is as important to engage in the process of Im, imparting knowledge and, um, and, and, and learning as it is to engage in a process of, of thoroughgoing criticism and resistance uh, and revolutionary struggle. So that's, that, it, the, the answer to your question resides precisely in praxis. It's not, there's no formulaic answer that I can give you. The only thing I can say is that you will learn as you engage in, in, in the resistance uh, in this place. And as, and you're, what year? You're third year, okay. And undergraduate students um, who are here only for four years, I mean, supposedly, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, their generations are very short generations. So they have to convey this, this knowledge as soon as you begin to learn, you have to pass it on. And the process of learning should also consist in the process of passing it on so that each generation that comes after you uh, will um, know how to straddle those contradictions uh, and con continue to develop legacies of resistance and struggle. But thank you so much. You should be up here talking to people. <laughs> Hi, Professor Davis. Um, I'm really nervous right now, so I apologize, but um, my name is Sarah May Dizon. I'm a student at Amaral High School, and um, I think in 2018, uh, social media has become uh, increasingly a big part of activism, but I think at the same time, it can make people feel as though they've uh, you know, done something and let their voice be heard, but at the same time, 
uh, taken no action. So my question to you is, how do you strike a good balance between you know, using social media to um, make your voice be heard, but at the same time, you know, um, taking real action? Well, again, I think that's probably a question that you would be able to answer better than me, <laughs> because you know, I didn't grow up with social media, you did. Uh, and that is, um, you know, oftentimes people assume that uh, when these new technologies uh, uh, emerge, that uh, we have to resist the technologies. Uh, and they don't realize that uh, after a while, they become given. This is just the way people relate to one another, uh, and hopefully not the only way. But, I mean, it is amazing that, that, it, that social media can be used. Uh, I mean, look, the, the, it took two minutes to sell the tickets, uh, uh, distribute the tickets for this event, you know, whereas in a previous time, it would have taken months and months of getting the word out and trying to organize an event um, as successful as this. Uh, the problem is, I think, and, uh, and I'm, you know, I, I, um, I, I use some social media, but I'm, my life is not uh, ensconced in social media in the way uh, that young people's lives are. Um, but I think that it can be used very effectively. Um, but at the same time, you should be aware of being used by the technology. Because if you begin to assume that, uh, and, and this is something that I got um, uh, from uh, Umi Salah, who is one of the um, um, major people in, in um, the Dream Defenders, uh, uh, who actually took a social media vacation for a while because they said the people were confusing likes with organizing, uh, and uh, that meant that they weren't doing the work that they really should have been doing to make connections uh, with people. So I think that, that the difference, there's a difference between mobilizing and organizing, and social media can be used really effectively to mobilize, uh, but other things are necessary to to organize, because or organizing is about creating a community of people who feel really connected to each other, who feel emotionally connected to, to one another, who are willing um, to um, take risks together, uh, who, who have, have similar ways of, of, of interpreting the world. And, um, I think we need more for that, but I think you probably know better than I what needs to be done, so thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, Professor Davis, uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, speaking with us and all the wisdom that you've imparted today. Uh, my name is Wes Gobar, I'm a fourth year, and uh, you spoke beautifully about contradictions, and I'd like to ask you as a former member of the Black Panther Party about a specific contradiction between uh, self-defense, the need for self-defense among marginalized people, especially black people, and this ultimate call for disarmament and, and pacifism. Um, you, know, right, you, you mentioned how the goals have changed now with prison abolition versus the Black Panther Party, but we're also seeing now this white supremacist terrorism um, rising. And you know, we saw it right here in Charlottesville. Um, there were these heavily armed militias and people here, and there were also um, Antifa, you know, there were also um, I, it, there, there's this tradition of, of being able to defend yourself. Keller Mike went on the NRA, you know, video the other day, and that was really cool. But uh, just how do we how do we call for how do we defend ourselves um, with this terrorism going on, and then also how do we also call for ultimate you know disarmament and pacifism uh, at the same time? Well, um, I mean, I'm not a pacifist. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, uh, and I, I, I mean, I, I grew up uh, uh, at a time when 
it was necessary to stand up to yeah. the Klan. My father had guns, uh, and I mean, I can remember, you know, on on many a night, my father, you know, taking his gun and going out to uh, uh, make sure that the Klan wasn't uh, um, in our yard because they were they they bombed houses and burned houses in our neighborhood. So, the, so I I mean, I grew up. Uh, Assuming that 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 we had the right to defend ourselves, uh, and I identified with uh, the Deacons for Defense uh, and uh, Robert Williams uh, in North Carolina, you know, who wrote the um, book Negroes with Guns. Uh, he was the head of the NAACP. At the same time, I have to point out that we have entered into a very different historical era. At that time, you know, there weren't like um, 400 million guns in the country. Uh, and so I, I, I have to say that I totally believe now in not, not only gun regulation, but I think the whole country needs to be disarmed. Um, including the military and the police. Um, um, but that, um, that sense that we need to defend ourselves is much, is much deeper than simply using guns or using weapons. Uh, it's about defending ourselves through organizing and, and building um, connections uh, through uh, um, community, and I think that's what we lack. We don't have the, we don't have, and when I say community, I'm talking about community that is politically based. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about assuming that just because you're black, uh, you belong to my community, uh, because uh, that doesn't work these days either. I mean, it, it used to sort of work but under, under the um, conditions of segregation, right? Uh, but things have changed, and I think we have to be willing to develop new approaches, and, and we need to be willing to uh, look back and um, revise our ideas. Uh, you know, there was a time when we thought that black liberation was liberation of the black man. And even though women were doing all of the work, they didn't deserve to be free. And so, so things change. Uh, uh, and um, now I think uh, what we really need is uh, a complete disarming of the United States of America. And if the US is disarmed, then that will also you know, have its uh, impact on uh, on the rest of the world. Because, I mean, how, is, can we imagine a future in which um, more and more guns are allowed? And this is one of the reasons why we have such violence in black communities. And again, the connection between, you know, what's, what happens on a daily basis in many black urban communities is not connect, the connections with school shooters haven't been made. And so, yeah, it's a complicated question, but I think it's a question that we really have to ponder and we, 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 we really have to figure out, but thank you. Thank you. So, we are like totally out of time. Okay. That said, we will try to get your questions in if you can make them in 10 seconds or less, yeah. right? And remember the dissertation versus question, okay? Okay, well, why don't we do uh, like five questions at a time, and then oh, I'll, good. and, then, and yeah. then I think that would be okay. better, and I'll make some notes. So, so why don't you all ask your questions? Oh, over no. there, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. yeah, you know. um, okay, you said you had thoughts on Wakanda. I would be very interested to know what they are. <laughs> So, Queen Davis, I wanted to ask, we know that the revolution is not going to be televised. However, 
when we look at like the faces that's out here, women, black women, black people in general should be filling this room right now just to thank you for the work that the Black Panther has done. So what would you suggest that we do to get people like you into black spaces, black churches, uh, black universities, bl black anything? What, what would you suggest that we do? Uh, Dr. Davis, how do you suggest reconciling one's selfhood and integrity with the obligation of maneuvering, often silently, through an institution championing our disempowerment? Hello, Professor Davis. Uh, my name is Shakira Hobbs. I'm a postdoc here at UVA. Um, and so my question is, uh, recently engineering education is under attack by alt-right groups saying that diversifying engineering and inclusion is somehow watering down, watering down engineering. Um, so how can the university can, um, combine diversity and just, with justice? Good day, Sister Davis. Um, I just want to ask, when, how do we get to the point in this country where we realize that everything that's happening right in front of us, all of these things that we are against, that we're fighting against, are right in us? You know what I mean? How do we get to the point where we look in the mirror and we say that even the things that are happening in Palestine and um, just happening all over the world are happening because American citizens are not standing up and taking responsibility for the power that we have in America? <laughs> And getting rid of the, and one more, I'm sorry, one more thing. The, uh, the definition of the word, the English, English uh, vocabulary in this, in this country. Um, Ten seconds. I don't think we can get rid of, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out how can we get rid of racism if we don't get rid of race? How do we get rid of sexism if we don't get rid of sex? Those Got things it. really do not exist. They're made up and they have a definition for them. They're labels, Got it. but they're Got not it. made up. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got <laughs> it. I've got my amen choir over here. <laughs> okay, this is five, five questions, so uh, maybe we yes. can do five okay. and then the last set of six. Very good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, it was an amazing experience to see Wakanda, wasn't it? I mean, it was... When have you ever seen so many, um, you know, beautiful, dark-skinned black women on the screen? That was amazing. Um, so the, you know, the visual experience was uh, um, so phenomenal that I think that it might uh, prevent us from adopting a critical stance. So. See, I, you know, whenever I'm enjoying something too much, <laughs> I, I try to uh, catch myself and say, uh, but I have to learn how to combine enjoyment and pleasure with criticism. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, first of all, there, you had all of these you know, amazing uh, black women who were doing all of the work. <laughs> and who was the leader? <laughs> so everybody should have caught that, right? Did you get that? Um, but then also, I'll say one other thing. Uh, um, I mean, there was a, the, the, the possibility to imagine something really revolutionary there. Of course, within, you know, the context of the comic book approach. And, uh, uh, but in terms of Afrofuturism, I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about writers like um, Octavia Butler, who, uh, who's whose work is just you know, so amazing. And, and incidentally, I, I just saw Parable of the Sower, which um, uh, Toshi Reagan and Bernice Reagan have adapted into a rock opera. Uh, and it was, I mean, it was amazing how prescient she was. Uh, uh, there, is a, there is a candidate uh, who, uh, whose slogan is Make America Great Again. 
<laughs> of course, she wrote this in the uh, um, was it late '80s, early '90s. So. Um, uh, but what 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 really struck me was also that uh, the person who is uh, uh, if 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 you, if you know Parable of the Sower, you know about the dystopic uh, uh, period of uh, violence and. Uh, poverty and I mean it's actually a kind of uh, when I think about Oakland and all, all the people who are living under the freeway and the you know the homeless crisis there it's kind of our present uh, that she evoked uh, uh, but the person who is the leader so to speak is a is a is a young young black woman uh, who's charged with the process of finding another space uh, and I think that Wakanda just kind of, it, it was really beautiful. And I don't want to um, say that I didn't enjoy it. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and I especially love the moments uh, such as, uh, you remember the, one of the warriors is approached by the um, white guy. Uh, and, he's, and, and, and the guy says, uh, uh, you better watch out. I'm, I'll feed you to my children. <laughs> and then he says, just kidding. My tribe is vegetarian. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I really like the way in which uh, they made us aware of all of the stereotypes about, about Africa. And there were many wonderful things about it. Uh, but I took issue with going to the United Nations because the United Nations is pretty much controlled by the U.S. anyway. So... All right, so we, that's the beginning of, a, of an interesting conversation on uh, Wakanda. Uh, and the, the, the next question, oh my God, what was it? Uh, the question over here, the, uh, about revolution? The revolution will not be televised. And how can, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I yeah, I see my notes. <laughs> um, you know, um, I don't know, maybe the revolution will be televised. Uh, I mean, Gil Scott Heron, Gil Scott Heron, um, you know, was a really important figure and, 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 and was a beacon of light and, and, and led the way. Uh, but I think the revolution um, is going to involve work that is much more intense and much more serious than we could have ever imagined. Um, and I don't really know whether there will be the revolution anymore. I used to think that that, that all we had to do was overturn capitalism and then we would also deal with uh, you know, heteropatriarchy and deal with all of the other issues. Uh, but now I'm, I'm thinking that uh, while we definitely need you know, major, dramatic, structural change, that um, I don't know whether we'll ever get to the point where we, we say that we've really achieved the goals that we need. I think that, that in the process of, of struggling, we learn so much more about what we should be doing. Uh, you know, as I was saying before, there was a time when we thought that all we were fighting for was freedom for the black man. We didn't even realize that as women who were doing all of the work, that we deserved to be free as well. So that consciousness had to uh, develop. Uh, uh, and. And so now, you know, we have this consciousness regarding the interconnectedness of, of, of gender and ability and sexuality and, and all of that. And, we're, and there are probably things that we consider normal now that will be totally contested in the future. So I think that what's exciting is that we're constantly changing. And that's why young people. So it's not about getting me. We should say how to get you in those spaces. Uh, because, 
you know, because I realize that, that, that my contributions are limited. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share my experiences and give you my ideas. But I learn much more from young people than I teach them. So I think that kind of intergenerationality of our um, communities of resistance is so, um, so essential. And we have to go beyond just black people too. You know, it's not just about black people. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think, and, and as black people, we have been the recipient of so much solidarity. As pe black people in the US, we have been the recipients of solidarities from people all over the world. Um, I mean, I just came back from Ireland. And the, the last time I went to Ireland, about a year ago, I was, I was shocked because they were talking about Frederick Douglass's visit. <laughs> <laughs> the 18 war, and they were they were still talking about the fact that Frederick Douglass came to Iowa. <laughs> uh, but I think that we also have to learn how to offer um, our solidarities, and we have to recognize that that that, for example, Islamophobia has transformed the whole terrain of racism, mm -hmm. and black people regardless of their religious beliefs, really need to stand up against Islamophobia. And, 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 and Brazil right now. I mean, terrible things are happening in Brazil. I, I don't know if you heard about the, the assassination of uh, Marielle um, Franco, who uh, was a, a major... Um, leader of the feminist movement, the LGBTQ movement. Uh, yeah, so I think we need, what we need to do is reach out and become more internationalists and recognize the extent to which our fates are intertwined. And, and so you can get that message out. Okay, thank you. Um, institutional empowerment, yeah. Uh, well, you know, thank you for that question, but I think that um, um, the, 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 the young woman who asked the question about this particular university um, also helped to provide us with some answers about how we can exist with integrity in spaces, in institutional spaces that are clearly responsible for the reproduction of, of, of racism and other forms of inequality. Uh, um, I don't know if we can find spaces that, that, that uh, are pure. You know, off, uh, you know students or, or, or people in the academy often say, well, I, you know, I think I think I need to go to another place where my work will be more valued. Uh, and, uh, and I, you know, I don't think we ever get outside of the system, regardless of what we do. We're always within. Uh, it's, it's just that we have to figure out how to create a terrain, an arena of struggle wherever we are. And that is our responsibility as individuals. Uh, uh, to help to create communities of resistance uh, everywhere. And engineering, yeah. Thank you for, where are you? Yeah. So you're an engineer? Yeah. Studying engineering? I'm a postdoc. You're a postdoc. Oh, wow. See, the older you get, the harder it is to judge somebody's age. <laughs> so when undergraduate students approach me, I, I, I try to err on the, on, uh, on the side of assuming that they're graduate students <laughs> because everybody looks young to me. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, um, that question of combining diversity and justice, uh, I, I think that um, it's about, it's about developing strategies of subversion and not allowing them to assume that they have captured 
your mind and your soul. I mean, of course, we need these institutions because um, the knowledge that we can generate in institutions like this is always helpful in so many respects. But we do not have to allow the institution to colonize our souls. Uh, I think, you know, that is the message. Um, so just a note that we're down to really like the last five minutes of our okay. time in the theater. Okay, and I think the, 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 the issue you raised here about the relationship between uh, um, our interior lives or our interior lives as a nation and um, uh, the, the larger questions, I think that was very, very important uh, because you're right, in the, in the US we don't tend to think enough about what it is we need to do uh, to um, prevent the U.S. Uh, from um, capturing um, the world. Now, you know, nobody takes us seriously anymore, mm -hmm. right, the government, people, they don't, so this is the perfect time to engage in that kind of subversion and to, to generate solidarities across national borders because nobody takes the government serious anyway. Uh, and, and he's not gonna be there that long, right? I mean, he's definitely, I don't think he's gonna last the, the, the next three years, uh, but... Uh, but we have to be prepared with a strategy of, um, of radical struggle and... Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, but I don't think we would have done, I mean, I can say now, if Hillary were president, where, where would we be now? I mean, we'd still have the same issues, the same problems, so. So, quick word? Yes. Quick word. S Sister Davis, thank you so much for coming, and I truly want to applaud all the young people that have come out, many of whom weren't even al alive when the height of your struggle and, and work was being done. As we approach the 50th marking of the, 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 what would be the, the murder of Dr. King, and we realized seven months ago we had Nazis marching through the street with tiki torches, what do we do to get people radicalized and energized and, and interested, specifically black and, and brown people, and, and, and how do we get them mobilized enough to, to, to want to take up the mantle and, and, and participate in the struggle that really, really benefits us Got as it. well as benefits the world? And how do we get rid of racist and oppressive <laughs> Confederate mon monuments? Yeah. <laughs> okay, quickly, please. Um, so the radical structural changes you're suggesting require large cultural change. What do you think the role of policymakers are in making cultural changes or just any of the changes you're suggesting? Thank you very much. Next. My question is similar to Don's. Um, going to UVA and asking administration to directly address these issues, what they do is rename buildings where they throw money at you and bring in great intellectuals, which is all great. I love you. But at the same time, the problem is still the same. I interned this past summer for a woman who was in the first 100 black students at UVA, and she graduated in 1973, and she still, her experiences are the same exact as mine. So how do we keep these students energized when they see no change? Thank you. Next. Uh, what do you think the relationship between environmental justice efforts and social justice efforts and other general anti-capitalist efforts is? Thank you. Thank you. Professor Green. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Professor Davis, uh, in light of the push from many universities to become more inclusive, I see in many places a trend of where you look at the K through 12 level, where you see, you know, you know basically kind of uh, uh, resegregation occurring. So I'm, I'm very curious, you know, in light of, you know, looking at separate but equal ruling by Taney back in the day to Brown v. Board in the 50s and 50s, will you come forward? What is your opinion about you know, the, like the charter school movement and things like that when, you know, basically we see the resegregation going on. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Thank you. Okay, I, I know I only have a couple of minutes and um, I mean, I think they're good charter schools, um, but 
I think the phenom phenomenon uh, militates against uh, what we need to do. That is to say, demand you know, quality public school education. I mean, the problem with the charter schools is that they are very much connected with the privatization trend. Uh, and so it's not only privatization of education, it's privatization of punishment, privatization of health care. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, we, need to, we need a revolution in education, uh, that's for sure. Uh, um, and I know I can't answer all of the questions, but, but, but let me, huh? Yeah, that's what I was, I was getting ready to say something about that. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the situation that uh, uh, led to Charlottesville acquiring uh, international notoriety. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I think it's good that, this, that there's a consciousness about these, these, these uh, statues and these artifacts that have been in our midst forever. And as Brian Stevenson pointed out, there's not a single monument to a black person who was lynched in the entire country. But I also have to say that simply getting rid of them is not gonna get rid of the problem. And there has to be a way to, um, to be able to remember the history. So I don't have a solution, but, I'm, but what I'm saying is that it, 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 to, to just pull down, of course the statue should come down. Uh, of course they should. But, but to just um, you know, get rid of them or put them in a warehouse and forget about the problems that they symbolize uh, is not going to be, is not going to bring any change. And so I think that 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 the kind of movement, um, because yeah, you, we saw those uh, uh, you know uh, fascists, white nationalists, uh, uh, with their arms and with their uh, vicious uh, uh, discourse. Uh, um, and I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, it, it's 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 a parody of the past. And I think, and 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 Trump is calling for this when he says, "Make America great again." I mean, it's it's really about making America white again and making America, you know, making America male supremacist again and all of that. But I think that our, 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 our movement has to be an intersectional movement against racism. And one of the things we realized when we s witnessed the events here in Charlottesville is that, <coughs> excuse me, anti-Semitism is still very, a very powerful force. And I can remember back in the 70s, when we were engaging in struggles against the Ku Klux Klan, and, 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 and you know, we talked about racism and anti-Semitism, and we realized the, the extent to which they were very much connected uh, to each other, and it seems to me that as a result of what has happened around um, um, challenges to the state of Israel, uh, We've also um, forgotten that uh, that we we have to stand up uh, passionately against anti-Semitism. I mean, I can remember when I was a child, when the Ku Klux Klan used to bomb churches, they also bombed synagogues, and th and therefore there was a a natural alliance between black people and Jews. And I think it's time for us to, to figure out how to build the kind of resistance that 
that acknowledges these historical connections and brings people together across uh, across the borders that are designed to divide us, uh, uh, young and old and gender and, 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 and race. Um, so, yeah, see, you here in Charlottesville can, can teach the country and the world very important lessons. Uh, you know, and I know, you know, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. So I, I, I have no um, doubts about the limitations of my you know, role as someone who comes to share ideas and stories with you. Uh, but the real work is organizing work. And that is work that happens uh, in, in venues that are very different from these theaters and, and, and auditoriums. It's, it's work that, that often isn't recognized, and this is why um, why women haven't been recognized, because women are the ones who have done that work historically. So I think now is the time to do that work, and men have to join. Am I right? Okay, this is the era in which men have to learn from women. And... And so thank you very much. I know we've gone way over time, but you know, ladies and gentlemen, for Angela Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. Please join us for our next event, which is, in the last event of the semester, Michael Sam, former NFL player and uh, LGBT activist, on Thursday, April 12th at uh, 6 o'clock in McLeod Hall. Thank you, and have a good night. <laughs>